And good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining our Oculus webcast series. Tonight, we're going to present Guiding Families Through the Complex Conversation of Myopia. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo. I'm Medical Director for Oculus. And I'm really excited tonight to have three incredible speakers on this really complex topic of myopia. Um, I'll first introduce Dr. Jason Jedlicka as an Associate Professor at Indiana University School of Optometry and Chief of Cornea and Contact Lens Service. He's a past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society and diplomate in the cornea and contact lens section of the American Academy of Optometry. A fellow and past board member of the Contact Lens Society of America, and he has special interests in studying ocular surface shape, contact lens design, and he's a partner of Lens Design Solutions, a contact lens design development team. And Dr. Jamie Cousinar is an owner and founder of Elevate Eye Care and Eyewear in Rochester Mills, Michigan. She's a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society and as well as the American Academy of Optometry and is an advisory board member for GPLI. And our third speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Thies, is completed her optometric uh, residency training in neurooptometry, binocular vision, and children's vision at UC Berkeley School of Optometry. After residency, she became the assistant clinical professor and founder in chief of UC Berkeley Sports Vision and Concussion Clinic. Simultaneously, Dr. Thies is also clinical staff optometrist at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, focusing on pediatric patients as well as neurooptometric cases. She has clinical experience in myopia control with both atropine and contact lens modalities. Dr. Thies is international lecturer on ocular motor, ocular eye movement disorders in the systemic and neurological condition and is currently on the AOA evidence-based optometry and vision rehab committees. With no further ado, we're gonna start this off with uh, Jackie Thies. Jackie, take it away. Thank you so much. All right. Perfect. So obviously I don't have to tell this group what myopia is, but we'll start just in case we have a technician in the audience here. Ooh, we're having a fun time with the slide deck. There we go. So as we know, myopia is a chronic condition of the eye that negatively impacts vision in people of all ages. And myopia is a disorder of refraction with uncorrected myopia being the leading cause of distance vision impairment. So the big thing really is just that you have an image that is focused in front of the retina. And it can be imaged in front of the retina because the eye is too long, or it can be because the corneas are a little bit too steep or a combination of the two. And the big question we always have to ask ourselves is why does myopia worsen? And the first reason that myopia worsens is because the kid's growing. And unfortunately, they keep doing that. And so there's some parts of myopia control that we just can't fix. And there are a lot of things that we can do. And so there are other influences that we know are making myopia worsen a little bit faster. So one, obviously, we know that some of the animal studies and observational clinical studies have shown that the retinal image itself and how it's projected onto the eye can influence the eye's growth. And so that's where some of the mechanisms of optically guided eye growth are influenced by other things like the environment. So how much are they outside looking far away versus if they're looking up close for long periods of time on devices? Um, what is their genetic history? What is their family history? Do they have parents that both have myopia as well? And of course, as we do more research, um, the myopia control paper, when we were doing that review for the AOA, there's just so much research that's coming out that I think is going to help us learn even more. But the big thing to learn is that at the end of the day, myopia will always be there. You know, we just have to be more proactive at controlling that which we can control and making sure that we recommend to people, you know, the point of myopia control isn't to completely, I mean, it would be wonderful to have no myopes. Says myopes. As a, as a low hyperope, I would disagree. Um, but the big thing is we want to make sure that we can prevent some of the really progressive forms of myopia and those that are detrimental to eye health. And the main reason that we care about myopia is because of the complications of myopia in ocular health. So we know that there's extensive reviews out there that myopia can cause increased risk of glaucoma. You can get cataracts sooner, myopic optic neuropathy, all types of uh, issues with the retina, including obviously retinal detachment, lacquer cracks, choroidal neovascularization. I mean, the list is a laundry list of things that can happen when you have high rates of myopia. And what studies have shown is that why we care about myopia control is that the higher the myope, the more likely the patient is to have 
um, complications and they have a higher risk of visual impairment. So even just a one diopter increase in myopia is associated with a 67% increase in the prevalence of myopic macul macular degeneration. So by slowing myopia by a diopter, you can reduce the likelihood of an individual developing myo myopic macular degeneration later in life. So it's just really important that we think about it from that standpoint, that a lot of what we're doing with myopia control is prevention for when that patient becomes an adult. And the prevention starts when they are a pediatric patient in your chair. When we think about visual impairment, a lot of those things can impact society. So myopia control is not just a problem with an individual, but actually as a whole, as patients get older and we start to lose our ability um, to control some of the complications of myopia, that is something that becomes uh, an undue cost for society. And so it's something that is a public health concern as well. And when we look at myopia in general, we have to think what matters more when we're looking at what are we controlling for myopia control? Does it matter more that their cornea is too curved or does it matter more that it's longer? And when you look from an ocular health perspective, um, it's pretty easy to say that the risk lies mostly in the elongation of the eye. And so it's a little bit safer to have someone who's myopic that has a steeper K than somebody who has in a, in a shorter eye than somebody who has a flatter K and a longer eye. And so at the end of the day, the point of myopia control is prevention and, and how important it is to prevent that pediatric patient from becoming more myopic more quickly and making sure that we keep the eye at a length and at a structure that is intact and prevents them from getting ocular disease. And so the question is, well, can we slow it? And I think a lot of the studies that have come out have said, yes, we can. Um, so within the United States, we have multiple modalities. The main modalities are going to be scleral lenses, uh, no, sorry, not scleral lenses, ortho-K lenses, um, as well as soft multifocal lenses, and then atropine. There's a lot of controversy, especially recently in the last few weeks with some of the papers that have come out regarding atropine and slowing the progression. And we have to make sure that when we're reading these papers that come out, we don't have one paper and just decide, oh, atropine doesn't work. We have to make sure that with every paper that does come out looking at myopia control, that we evaluate, well, what was the population that was studied? Why did atropine work in one study, but not another study? And is it because the populations are so different? Maybe there's a genetic reason that atropine works in one group versus another or there, it has to do with the way that the study was designed. Um, so even though there was a really well, well done study that came out that showed that 0.01% um, atropine didn't work so well in a population of kids in the US, um, there could be reasons why it didn't work. Maybe it was the concentration of the population. And so we have to make sure that as providers, when we have competing um, information that comes out, that we do a good job at looking at what is the study population and does that mimic the clinical population I'm seeing? Because if my clinical population is similar to that of the study, then I'm gonna to wanna to pay more attention to what that says about the study than if you have a clinical population that's the complete opposite. Um, and know that at the end of the day, in addition to what science says, um, there's a lot of really great treatment options out there. You also have to figure out what option is best for your patient, which is really done best on the individual level. And I'm gonna hand that over to Dr. Kuzner. All right. Thanks, Jackie. So that ties it right into, you know, what's best for my child. I think the hardest part about doing myopia management is talking to the parent. Okay. Um, because the parents are going to have a lot of questions. So this is something that they've never heard of before. Um, sometimes they'll come into my exam lane and they will already have done hours of research on the internet and they already know exactly what they want their kid to do. Sometimes a parent will come in for a myopia consult from outside and they have no idea why they're even there. Um, they don't know what myopia is. They don't know if their kid needs glasses. They've never heard of OrthoK okay or MySight or any of these lenses. And they just look at you with a blank stare. So my advice always is to kind of gauge, you know, the first question I ask is, what? tell me what do you know about this? Because I want to know exactly what they've already researched um, and what they haven't. So I don't want to be talking down to them if they've already decided uh, what they want for their child. But the main thing is just to keep it simple. So Jackie shared a ton of really great information, but if we were to present it like that to the parents, they would be so confused, okay? So keep it simple. So I like to, I love this eye model right here. Uh, so I just basically explain, you, you know, your child's eye has grown too big. It is too big from front to back. So that's causing some issues long-term for your child. So I say, look at your child right now. I'm not concerned about them today. I'm not concerned about them in six months or a year. 
I'm concerned about them when they're an adult. And that's really hard for a parent to think about, I need to do this now. So that way, when my child is an adult, they don't have these issues moving forward. Um, I think handouts and charts are really helpful. I love this little chart here because it can break down their level of myopia versus lifetime risk of just a couple things. So there's a few different charts out there. I like this one because it talks about, you know, retinal detachment um, and maculopathy. These are the two most common ones I feel like the parents are going to know about. And it really breaks it down by their level. You can say, okay, your child is a minus three. Right now, their relative, relative risk of being a retinal detachment is nine times average, right? So that's already worse than we want, but if we can slow it down so they don't get up to a minus five where that jumps to 21 or above a minus seven where it's 44. So they can see that it escalates pretty quickly uh, because a, a lot of times I get like, well, what's the point? My kid is already a minus five. Is it even worth it for me to, to do um, myopia management with my child? And I say, yes, uh, I mean, I'm currently doing ortho K on a 16 year old that's a minus six because if I can stop them from even getting to a minus seven or minus eight, I still think it's worth it for that child. Um, and there's a, there's a fine line between expressing concern and inciting fear. So that's another thing when we're talking to the parents, we have to realize that there is a small child in the room with us and they're listening. Um, and a lot of these kids nowadays might get anxiety about this, right? And you can talk about how, you know, if you don't do this, your kid's gonna go blind. I never want a nine-year-old thinking that if my parent doesn't do this, that I'm gonna go blind as an adult. Right, so it's, it's a fine line between, you know, stressing the importance of it and also not worrying the child. Um, and I like to involve the child in with the conversation as well. So not just only talking to the parent, I like to turn to them and just say, you know, what do you think about all this? What do you think about all these crazy things that I'm saying uh, with mom and dad? Um, do you think that this is something that you wanna do yourself? So looking at some common questions, um, I, I threw in a few here on the next couple slides, but. Um, Jackie and Jason, if you guys have any really common questions that you get in your offices, let me know too. Um, I think the first question is always, why can't they just wear glasses? Okay, why can't my kid just wear glasses? That's what I did, um, and I'm fine. I don't, ha I don't have a retinal attachment. You know, I'm a minus five. Why, why can't my kid just wear glasses? Or why can't we just undercorrect their vision? Uh, I get this one all the time uh, because parents seem to think, well, you know, every year I got stronger glasses, and then my eyes just got worse. So maybe we should just not update the glasses this year. Their eyes won't get used to the prescription. Um, and I think all of us hopefully are aware of the studies that show that undercorrecting actually makes myopia get worse faster, okay? So that was a, a myth in the past that we might have practiced and done years ago, but that is something that we need to correct with the parents and say that that's, you know, that's a myth, unfortunately. Um, so if you were undercorrected as a child, that actually just made your eyes worse uh, so we're not going to do that for your child. Um, and what's the difference, you know, between myopia management with a soft lens and the soft lenses that I wear? Because a lot of times the parents are wearing multifocal contacts themselves. So why does my kid need some special multifocal contact that costs more money? Why can't they just wear what I'm wearing? Uh, and so just being able to describe um, what peripheral to focus is without necessarily saying like peripheral to focus and describing all of that. Um, a lot of times I just try to keep it simple. I just say it is a soft lens similar to what you wear yourself, uh, but it has a special customized design on the front of the lens that tells the eye, stop growing, right? You've already grown too much. So it's just telling the eye signaling to stop, stop its growth factors essentially. I know that's not technically scientifically accurate, but I think that that's an easier way to explain what's going on versus getting out all these ray diagrams and drawing it for these parents um, and having them get totally confused. Would you guys agree with those? Do you have any input on any of those common questions? I mean, I think those are common for sure. Um, I, I also love the, the, um, the comment parents will make and, and they'll say, can't you just teach my kid or tell my kid not to, not to play their device as much, things like that, you know, um, which doesn't know. really get to the heart of the, of the true problem. But, um, Parents definitely have a lot of questions when you start going down this road, I, I would totally agree. Yeah, it's always, I mean, the devices, that is a discussion to have, um, but I think a lot of times they wanna blame everything on the devices, which we know, you know, is not true. Some of it's genetics that comes from mom and dad. Um, and I think there's a lot more questions about orthokeratology. That is something that I get the most questions about because it's something they've never heard of. 
It's like, okay, so you're telling my kid to sleep in contact when I've been told my entire life, never sleep in my contact lenses. And now you're telling my eight year old that you only sleep in them. Um, usually the number one question is like, how is safe is it? And it is really safe. Uh, and there's a lot of studies that prove that orthokeratology is safe. Um, and if they want those studies, I'm more than happy to share them with them. I tell them that OrthoK has been FDA approved for over 20 years. So even though they haven't heard of it, it's not something new and experimental that I'm doing with their child. Um, one question I've gotten a lot this year, particularly, and I don't know if it's just in my area, is I have a lot of parents surprised that the, the child can see through an OrthoK lens during the day. And they say, well, why can't they just wear them during the daytime? Why do they have to wear them while they're sleeping? Um, I don't know. Have you guys been getting that question lately? I've got it at least like five times in the last two months is why can't my kid just wear these lenses during the day? And I, I usually I just say, well, you know, they're not the most comfortable thing in the world to wear while they're waking. Um, but also because it's reshaping the lens at the front of their eyes. So we don't want them blinking and moving around. Um, but that's just an interesting one that I get. So kind of a heads up in case you get those questions from your parent. Um, is ortho -K permanent? So there's a lot of misconceptions about if my child wears ortho -K, oh great, so now I'll make him perf perfect and they'll never have to wear glasses ever again. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Or they'll ask if they start wearing these, will it make it so their prescription reverses? Um, also, unfortunately, not the case as well. Um, and I think the number one is why haven't I heard about this before with other doctors? And that is also a really fine line to skate because you never want to throw any of your colleagues under the bus. Um, and I think they might have heard of it and maybe the parents kind of brushed it off or didn't think about it. So it's not, they might have heard of it before um, or maybe they haven't. So even if they haven't, I just say, you know, um, but that's why you're here today. That's why your doctor referred you today and we're gonna take care of it now. I try to really um, keep it keep it civil between our local um, other optometrists and ophthalmologists before. Um, I just say, well, the good news is you're hearing about it now. And if they say that I didn't tell them last year, then I know I did tell them last year because I always tell them. Uh, so sometimes parents uh, and patients aren't always truthful. And then looking at like the pros and cons of which treatment option to pick. So we kind of had a little bit of this discussion when Jackie was saying like, what, what's your guys' go-to for, for uh, myopia management? And I really think it just depends on the child. Um, a lot of times I can just kind of assess while I'm doing the workup with the kid, what is going to be the best option for this kid based on my 20 minute interaction with them. Um, I can already tell, like, are they going to be able to put a contact lens in? Are they going to be nervous? Are they going to listen to their parents? So it's really just tailoring it based on the child. Um, I think looking at their prescription is a really big factor for me. Where are we starting at? Looking at the age, how old are they? Looking at different lifestyles and hobbies, uh, especially swimming. That's why I put that picture there. You know, if I have a child that's going to be swimming every single day or they have a pool, I'm going to lean more towards, you know, ortho -K and not necessarily towards soft lenses. Um, looking at the motivation of the child and the parent. And I always have this discussion with the parents is even if you are 100 percent on board, if your child does not want to do this, it is not going to work. And it's going to be an uphill battle every single night to either put drops in their eye or put a lens on their eye. Um, so really just kind of getting both the child and the parent on board. Um, and then looking at the main three options that are available in the United States right now, uh, with atropine being the first one. So in my area, you know, atropine is really first line for a lot of my pediatric ophthalmologists. So a lot of patients come to me already using atropine um, for a couple of years. I mean, the pros of it is it is it's easy to use. So even if your child is afraid to use drops, I have a lot of parents that will put the drops in after their child is asleep. Uh, they'll just kind of sneak a little drop in each eye. Um, and that works well. Um, it's better for kids that are a little bit nervous about contact lenses, or maybe they're too young to wear a contact lens. Um, it's a great addition to other treatments. So if they're already in ortho K or multifocal contacts and they want, you want to do a combination therapy, it's a great treatment option. Um, usually a little bit reduced chair time and office visits because you're not training with insertion and removal. Um, lower cost, I said, yeah, kind of. Um, because you do have to get this through a compounding pharmacy. So it actually can add up over time um, to get these drops every month or two shipped to the house. So some of the cons of atropine that I see, um, number one is having to get it at that compounding pharmacy. As of right now, you can't just go to CVS and get this uh, special eye drop. It has to 
come through a special, you know, mail order pharmacy, or sometimes you can get them locally. So that just creates accessibility issues for your patient. Um, compliance. I, I really think like the patients that come to me on taking atropine for a few years that progress, I don't really think they're taking it every night. And I have the parents say a lot, well, we kind of, we remember sometimes, or we'll remember like every third day, we'll to put a drop in the eye. Um, so compliance definitely is a big factor uh, with the patients there. Um, potential side effects, um, having that little bit of dilation that does happen. So some kids that are a little bit more light sensitive, sometimes I'm, I'm concerned with um, if they already have BV issues, if that's gonna cause um, a little bit of a reduction of focusing, looking at kind of long-term use of atropine in general. I have a lot of parents in my area that don't necessarily want their child on a prescription medication long-term. Um, they just wonder about any kind of side effects of that um, or rebound effect after they take off. Um, and, and then another main con is having to still wear glasses and update those every year. So even though you know a lot of times we think atropine is like the cheaper, easier option, um, you still have to deal with the glasses every, every year and updating those every single year as well as the child is growing. Anything that you guys want to add about atropine? No? Good. Yeah, you do, Jaffe? I was going to say, so I actually used, because I've worked with pediatric ophthalmology, so that was always our first line. So I have a lot of experience in atropine, and I've had really great success. I feel like everyone bashes it, especially people who are really good at fitting contacts like you guys. Um, I've had great success with, with atropine and, and literally I've watched a kid get worse, get worse. We put them on atropine. It just stops. Um, and same with pediatric ophthalmology, which I think is why they got on board so quickly. Um, yeah. I think the big thing though, is that you have to know what the cons are of it. So I, you have to tell them it's just like glaucoma drops. You can't take it once a week. You got to take it every day. <laughs> and you just have to make sure that you have a really good education consult with the parent. You do still have to do installation. Um, in my experience, it stings for the kid for the first four weeks. And then after about three to four weeks, they stop complaining of it stinging and the kid says it doesn't bother them. I've found it works really well, especially like I've had a couple of two, three, four-year-olds that come in at a minus two, minus three already because both their parents are minus eight to minus tens. Um, and so for me, atropine was really easy because trying to wrangle in a contact lens into a two or three-year-old can be very difficult. The mm -hmm. other thing to also think about is the culture where people are from um, and because that can have a really big impact as far as what people's thoughts are on contact lenses. So we had some issues. Um, I worked at the Berkeley Myopia Control with some of the, the faculty there when I was at Berkeley. And some of the things that would come up is that a lot of the parents were really concerned because in the countries that they came from, contact lenses weren't prescribed by optometrists. They were just an over-the-counter thing. And so they're, they're kind of villainized in some of those countries because when they, they're they notorious for causing eye infections because nobody has good hygiene because it's literally just something you pick up at CVS. No one told you to take them out and clean them. And so ophthalmologists in other countries villainize a lot of contact lenses for that reason. And so if a parent's coming in with that background, you can give them a thousand studies on contacts and you're not going to go back, especially if that parent had a bad reaction or had an infection and they have scarring. So I think the, the big thing for me is as much as people villainize atropine, there's a really big role for it. And I think it's really important. I think multifocals and, and they're my go to ideally, um, but I, I don't shy away from atropine, I feel as much as some of my colleagues do. And I think that's mainly just because I always want to make sure I understand where they're coming from with it. And I, I head on the cons um, with like patient information and things like that. So that's what I would add. I've, I've had great success with atropine. So, yeah, I think just getting ahead of it. And one thing to do too, is just make sure you're still doing those follow-ups. Like you still have to check in throughout the year. You don't want to just be writing a script for atropine and then having them back for their annual, you know, just like how, like with glaucoma, you wouldn't just write a, glaucoma script and say see you in the year you want to keep checking pressures um checking for any kind of issues side effects kind of jumping ahead of those cons um so even though that's almost an easier one like here's your script bye see you in a year um just making sure you're still doing the myopia management program uh even though they're, you're not checking a lens you're still checking in on the child um and that leads us into soft multifocal lenses as well um a great option just because right now it's it's FDA approved for myopia management. Like I love that it's got the FDA approval. Um, so parents feel more confident in that. Uh, so, and I also love that it's just bringing more awareness um, to the public. So I, I love that. 
Um, I love that it's a daily disposal option. There's options available for those patients. Um, they're comfortable. Uh, they're easy to take care of, especially if they're daily. You should just take one, you toss it out, or even if it's, if it's a monthly. Um, I should put that on the cons. Not as many options for astigmatism patients. Uh, that's the hard part is when patients come in and they're like, oh, I saw this you know, commercial or something about my site. I want my kid to wear it. And they have two doctors of astigmatism. Like, unfortunately, it's not going to work out with how the prescription is. Um, I feel like the, the chair time is a little bit lower. It's just like a normal soft contact lens sitting. So once you get past that insertion removal, not a lot of extra chair time involved with that minus your normal follow-ups throughout the year. Um, some of the cons like compliance. So I feel like my patients that go into the soft multifocal lenses, sometimes their parents want to treat it as a, oh, they'll wear them while they play in basketball or, oh, they'll wear it, you know, these days and then wear their glasses on the weekends like I do. And it's like, no, that you have to wear this lens every day in order to get the full effect of the treatment. So it's not like a part-time wear situation. Um, I feel like insertion and removal for soft lenses is harder for kids because the lens is so much bigger and flimsier. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to train an ortho -okay lens on a patient. Um, they still have to wear backup glasses. So sometimes when I explain that, you know, once they hear about ortho -K and how like, wow, it's so magical, they don't have to wear glasses or contacts anymore. Um, you know, I'll tell the parents, you know, they can wear these soft lenses and they work during the day, but they'll still have to wear glasses at night. So for some parents, that's a con. Um, the other thing too, and I know Jason and I have talked about this a little bit, uh, the fact that the dailies available for our patients are only in like a low DK option. And kind of looking at like, what's, what's the risk of fitting any child in a low DK lens that they're gonna wear every single day, pretty much all waking hours, for, I don't know, a decade or more of their life versus other options. I don't know if you want to chime in on that or even go off on that, kind of <laughs> get off on that tangent, but that is a concern that I have because with every other patient I have, I'm fitting sky high lenses. And then for our myopia lenses, I have to kind of revert back to a low TK lens on a child. So. Yeah, that's definitely a concern for me too. And I know that we'll have new options in the in the years to come that will address that. But for now, it's still a consideration, especially on a on a very young child who will likely be in lenses for many years. And then our last one is Ortho K. Um, and the video I have playing um, is my seven year old nephew, and that mm -hmm. is the first time he put in an Ortho K lens. And that is how fast he learned it and how fast he did it. So I just kind of wanted to put that in there um, because I was so proud of him. And I think a lot of times we worry about kids wearing wearing contacts, like, oh, they won't be able to do it. Uh, and a lot of times the parents will say, I think he'll be too nervous. Um, but I mean, look at little E in there. He did it so fast and he's even wearing a mask because he was during COVID. Uh, and he's been in ortho -okay for three years. He loves it. So, you know, the pros with ortho -okay, um, it's the magical lens where they don't need glasses or contacts throughout the day. So that's, that's nice uh, for kids and for parents. I think it's easier to train insertion or removal because the lens is really small. Uh, so it's a lot easier for them to take in and out. Um, I like that I can customize it for more prescriptions, especially for patients with astigmatism. Um, if those soft lenses just don't fit the parameters, it's really good for active kids, especially if they swim a lot. Um, some of the cons, it's a hard lens. It's gonna feel like a hard lens and they're gonna have to adapt to that for the first few weeks. Um, another con is like, you know, with my kids, a lot of times they'll, they'll get one pair a year, they might get a backup. Um, so if they lose or break that lens, it turns into kind of like panic mode, or what do I do until the new lens gets manufactured and shipped out in a couple days. Um, so that is like a responsibility issue, you have to, that the kid has to take care of the lens instead of it being just a disposable. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit more chair time for more complex or high prescriptions. Um, some of my older kids or high, high RXs will notice some issues with halos because we are getting that peripheral blur in the pupil. And then cost. Cost, I mean, ortho K is, in my opinion, a little bit more expensive than the other options. Um, but also long-term, moving forward from year to year, it's really not. If you think about how much uh, dailies are every single year, they have to buy a year supply for your child. Um, it kind of balances out. So it's a bigger upfront initial cost, but I think um, long-term, it's very comparable to the other options. So any other comments about what's okay before I hand it off? I don't know about your experience, but I feel like 
there's an age where because the little kids don't have any fear of yeah. anything from like five until like nine they're actually like ideal for fitting contacts they get yeah. nervous from like nine to 13. <laughs> and then I feel like those ones are harder because now they like think about it more um, that's, I don't know if that's your experience but for me the younger ones are like boom <laughs> you're like okay <laughs> that's true I actually I kind of made a little game of that um at my office so I started making a um little kids versus big kids game and so I've been joking with my big kids I'm like listen all my teenagers have been it's really hard for you all to put the contacts in but I said let me just tell you I had an eight-year-old in here and they were so fast but I know you're just gonna I said you're gonna bring up average and then they're like all right I can't let an eight-year-old like kick my butt over here so, <laughs> so I usually just bring up the fact that like I know you're scared but I have like little kiddos in here that, that do it and they love it. So, but yeah, I do notice that. I feel like that age group is harder to trade than the youngers for sure. Yeah. So another reason to start sooner. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, before I jump into the next section here, I just want to um, take a moment and, and make a few comments on what we've covered so far. And, and that is, you know, um, as we present myopia to the parents of our children, um, again, we, we have this notion of myopia being nearsightedness. And, and the reality is, is that is most of this, but this is really about axial length, right? Um, the only aspect of this that's really important in terms of myopia control is, do we want this child to be able to have a lower prescription for future you know, for future refractive procedures or something like that. But ultimately, the concern is not that the child is a minus four, minus five, but that the child has a longer axial length at minus five than they did at minus four. So that's our concern. And that's that's where we have to communicate that that part of this, because, you know, again, most myopic kids have myopic parents. So the parents already have a perspective on what myopia is. But what they maybe don't have the concept is, is the risk to the health of the eye that they have. They may not even know they have this risk to their eye and that we need to make sure that their children don't end up with the same level of risk that the parents had. When do you have this discussion with parents, you know, about the child? I mean, when do you have a discussion with, with any patient, for example, about glaucoma? I mean, it's part of every exam I do to basically tell my patients, you know, no signs of glaucoma, no signs of this, no signs of that. There's nothing wrong with having a discussion with every single pediatric child and their parent in your practice, no signs of axial length growth, you're good, or your eye is growing and we want to slow down that change. So you say, who do you talk to about it or when do you have the discussion? I say you have it with every kid who walks into your office on every appointment. And sometimes it can be just as brief as you don't have this problem, you don't have to worry about it. Great, that's awesome, good news. Or you do have something starting up here, and we should be addressing it. Another part that makes it really easy, and you know, some of some of us have children, some of us don't. Um, I've got five of them, two of them are myopes. The easiest thing for me is when a parent asks about this, I say, Well, I have two myopic children, and I do myopia management with both my kids. And this is what we do. And it becomes really easy then to help the parent understand, well, if, if you think it's important for your children, I understand now why it's important for my children. And if you don't have children, you still maybe have nieces or nephews like Dr. Kuzner mentioned, and, or you have staff members with children. And so I would say that to become proactive and fit people you know, fit the children of people you know, in some type of corrective lens or prescribing atropine to manage their myopia gives you the opening to the discussion. Well, this is what I do for my relatives or my staff's children or whatever, or my kids if you have them. Uh, I think that's critical that we have a perspective to share from personal experience whenever we can. So those are just some thoughts I wanted to put out there and, um, and then we can move on. So we, Dr. Kuzner mentioned already, you know, the options for managing myopia. And we talked about the different atropine concentrations. We talked about glasses, whether they be, you know, what we have available now in the US. Some of you are listening from other countries. You have more options. Maybe you have myopia controlling glasses. 
Uh, we hope to have them here in the state soon. Uh, we have soft multifocals or defocus lenses, ortho K or combo therapy. And so what I'd love to do is talk about with, with both of you, you know, how do you decide what to um, put any given patient on to manage their myopia? Am I controlling? There we go. And so um, I put a few things on here, and, and this is, Dr. Kuzner had a very similar list a minute ago, but one of the things that I don't have on here that she did is the patient's prescription, because truly it's irrelevant. That's why this really isn't about managing myopia so much as it's about managing axial length, because I'm much more concerned about a child who's gone from being a plus 150 to a plus 50 with a 25 millimeter axial length that I am about a child who's gone from a minus two to minus 250 with a 23.5 millimeter axial length. There's a difference. And so it's really about the change to the axial length. That's really what it comes down to. Age is important. We know that the younger the child is, the more years ahead of them that they have to progress and get worse. And so that becomes a critical factor. Um, my concern level for a five-year-old who's a minus one is much different than a 15-year-old who's a minus one. The family history is important, the number of myopic parents, of course. Um, there's absolutely a risk factor for family history. Um, we can discuss why myopic parents have myopic children, whether the, there's something specifically inherited or generically inherited, like a pliability of the eye, um, but Regardless, that's a factor. Rate of progression to date should matter. Uh, a child who's progressed by a quarter over the last two years is probably in a different category than someone who's progressed by one and a quarter over the last two years. And again, ultimately axial length. And, and you might say, well, I don't have a biometer. I, don't, I can't measure axial length. Uh, guess what? You can estimate axial length, okay? Because you know, you all probably have keratometry of one kind or another. If you know what the patient's Ks are and their Rx are, guess what? There's a formula to figure out their axial length and you can calculate it. And so if you have a, a like we mentioned earlier, if the patient has um, Ks of 45 and a minus one, um, you can calculate their axial length versus a child, again, whose Ks are 40, who's a minus one. One of them is far more concerning and that is the one who's got a flat cornea than the patient with a steep cornea. So these are all factors which come into play. So I'm gonna give this to you guys. I'll talk through it and then both of you, if you can just tell me what you would do and how you would approach discussing this with the parent. Okay, what would your approach be? So um, theoretical five-year-old female, no current corrective lenses, first time seeing you, both parents are myopic. The RX has gone from plus a quarter to minus a half in the last year. Her Ks are 41. Her axial length is 25. She has brown irises, which factors in for the atropine part. So, A, um, what's, your, what's your level of concern? How are you going to approach this case with the parent? And then what would you go with for initial treatment? And um, I'll give this to Dr. Kuzner first, and we'll switch back and forth. All right, cool. Um, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned, to be honest. I think once they, once you cross over to that minus threshold, that is a concern for me, um, especially if this is a true like cyclo prescription, okay? So it's not like an artificial, the kid was over-focusing. If it's a true cyclo, you know, good rec, uh, then I'm concerned with it and I'm gonna bring it up. Um, this would be a good person I would start atropine on. Um, and the reason why, and I will say, just the reason why I did say Rx makes a difference on treatment is because if someone changed from, you know, plus a quarter to minus a half, I wouldn't necessarily do ortho K and minus a half. Um, so that's kind of why I added, you know, prescription, just because of the options available for the lenses. Um, but for this patient, I would definitely talk about it, bring it up, especially with the myopic parents. Um, and I would talk about starting atropine with them. So even if they don't want to um, today, and if they said, no, I don't want to do atropine, I'd say that's fine. And let's just do a follow-up in six months. So okay. it, whenever a parent says no, I like to do a follow-up um, in less than a year. And then that way, if they have progressed, which they likely will, we can revisit um, and we don't lose another six months. 
Okay. And what, what concentration atropine do you want to put this child on? I would probably start 0.025. Okay. It's probably what I'd start at. I, I don't, I don't think 0.01 is enough uh, nowadays, so 0.025 is probably what I would start at. Okay. Um, Dr. Thies, you want to jump in and give me your perspective on this? Sure. So, um, and then I'll also make kind of a comment to what you had said earlier, because you made some really great points about when to plant the seed on myopia control. And I actually plant the seed during my adult exams too. So if mm -hmm. I have a patient who is, I'm just seeing the a parent and I say, do you have kids? And then I, I actually plant the seed while they're getting their eye exam of like, you should get your kid for an eye exam and know that your kid's at a higher risk of myopia control. And that helps plant the seed a little bit. For me, the big one actually is trying to suss out how the parents feel and understanding how they feel about their myopia. Um, you have some parents that come in and their myopia really impacted their life, in which case those ones are very easy. If I'm like, hey, I'm concerned your kid is, my I am concerned, just like Dr. Kuzner. I'm concerned for many reasons. Number one, she's only five. She's only going to grow. Number two, she hasn't even learned to read yet, really. So when we're talking about environmental factors, it's only going to get worse because she hasn't even read yet. And she's already myopic. Um, she's kind of got every risk factor against her at this point. So for me, I'm really concerned. And when it comes to, I would do essentially what Dr. Kuzner would do. The one thing that I do do that's a little different in my practice, and this might be helpful for some of the people on the call that maybe you don't do sclerals or you don't do specialty lenses or you don't do any type of multifocals or, or all of that seems overwhelming, including the ortho K. Um, I don't do those in my practice. And so it doesn't mean I don't offer them as options though. So what I've done is I've created a really solid network of providers around me that do those lenses and I have a list. So I provide and I educate all my patients on the options out there for them. And it, I can do the atropine for them, but if they don't wanna do atropine and they wanna try something else, I have a list of colleagues that I can send them for. Also, I think axial length is crucial and I, I don't prefer to, I prefer to measure that. So I usually will say if the kid doesn't want it, um, I actually have networked with other clinicians as well who have a way to a biometer. And I just say, I'm gonna have you go over to this practice. They're gonna do the biometer measurement on you and then they'll send me the results. And so I've actually just worked out agreements with other local offices. Um, so I don't think that not having the equipment is a reason to ignore the care for this kid. Um, and the big thing for me on how to present it to the family is, trying to suss out, you know, when are you ready? What are your thoughts on myopia and how concerned are you? And if they're not super concerned, I make them come back in three months if they don't mm -hmm. want to do treatment so that we can remeasure so they can see how concerned I am. Because I think if you're like, oh, you're not concerned, see you in a year, then that tells them I'm not concerned. But mm -hmm. if I'm like, you know, let's start treatment, see you in six months, I'm less concerned because we're treating it. Um, so I think there's that too. And the other option I'll give for families, because if trying to have this conversation in front of a five-year-old can be hard, is I actually give telemedicine consults for parents and say, hey, I'm concerned about this. We can talk about it now, or if you'd like, we could schedule a separate visit on telemed and talk about it then. And I've had a lot of parents do that because trying to have this conversation while they're trying to wrangle their five-year-old after the five-year-old's been cycloed is hard. Um, so that's I love that idea. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Yeah, um, they completely, or if, or if only one parent is present mm -hmm. because they're not expecting to have some huge decision. They just think, oh, I'm gonna bring my kid for a well check. Um, not like, okay, there's this huge problem and you need to decide right now. And I always offer that to if whatever parent is not there, you know, go home, talk it over. And then if you have any questions, call me. Um, especially because, yeah, I, I have a two and a four year old. And let me just tell you at the end of any well visit, I'm like trying to, you know, feed them snacks and listen to the doctor. And it is so hard to make a logical decision uh, with these young kids. So that's, that's a great option to do the telehealth. I might actually take that from you. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I wanted to ask you, and, and I know that there's some debate over whether this is helpful at this stage. My feeling is there's nothing magical about when a child becomes myopic um, because they've already probably, their axial length has already grown even while they were still hyperopic. But do you discuss outdoor time with a child like this? Is that still something that's part of your discussion? Yeah, I, I actually talk about outdoor time with every child. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll bring it up even if they if they don't need glasses or they haven't changed or they're hyper -op, I'll just say, you know, the best, the best thing that you can do for your eyes is go outside and be a kid. And that is free and you should be doing it anyways. And then the parents love that. But I, I always end every single child exam uh, with, you know, wear your sunglasses and then go outside and be a kid. 
like, and that's just a nice little wrap it up and put a little bow on it. And I walk them out to the front. So I think, like, I think we should be talking about that with everybody. Yeah. And I think to your point earlier, where you were saying every parent wants us to be the, the doctor that says no to iPads. Right. And it's like, well, first of all, I'm not the parent. You're, you're the parent. Right. Um, but I can absolutely get behind telling your kid to go outside and play more. Um, and, and it's just good for all kinds of health to just get up and move from so, for so many reasons. So yeah, I have that. If you want to play, play on your tablet, go play on it, go out in the yard and play on it. All right. <laughs> all right. So we had another case here real quick. We got an eight year old male who's coming in wearing distance only spectacle lenses, one myopic parent, a little change in prescription, minus two to minus 250 in the last year. K's are on the steeper side, axial length a little shorter, blue iris color. Um, what are you going to talk to the patients about with this one or the parents about with this one? And what would you recommend at this stage? Um, so Jackie, I'll let you take this one first. So given the most recent paper that came out, I think my options, what I would lean towards for them would be more a contact lens, um, knowing that they have a blue iris color and their age and demographics. So if I wanted to do myopic control, I'd be leaning more towards contact lenses than atropine. Um, Anytime there's progression for me and they're eight, I mean, they're still young. I, I would have the same question or same conversation as I would have with the, with the five-year-old and, and I would just want to monitor them. And, and I'm a very big fan of, I don't force any parent to do anything. At the end of the day, everyone has their own decision on their own healthcare. All I can do is provide them education. And if they decide that they want to do it, great. But if they don't, then my big thing is, well, then let's monitor it closely. Just like if somebody had high eye pressure and they decide they don't want to treat their ocular hypertension, great, you just get to see me more often um, until at some point, you know, I really think you're going to lose vision by not treating. Um, so I have the same conversation. Okay. Jamie? Um, and yeah, and just to add to that too, um, like if, if a parent absolutely doesn't want to do it, I always just, you know, I just say, no, that's my no hard feelings. It's my job to educate you. It's your job to take the information and decide it's best for your child at the end of the day. Um, and I just say it like that, very non, you know, you don't want to be judgmental or come across as harsh or rude or whatever, but um, it's your job to educate them. Whether or not they want to hear it, you know, I, you still got to do your job. Um, but with this patient being eight years old and already like a minus two to 250 in general, I think that's pretty high for their age. Um, I think this is, this is a great candidate for us, okay? Um, with steep case, um, easy, like a softball pitch uh, for ortho, okay? Um, or if they're really against ortho, okay, that it's not for them. I think soft contact lenses would, would be a good option as well. But that's what I would lean toward, especially with the um, blue iris color. Um, but I think I think that eight year old is a great time to start ortho, okay. So that's what I would lean towards. Okay. Um, I think you know a critical difference between these last two cases, and you guys kind of alluded to it a little bit, is the actual need for vision correction. Our, our first patient we talked about, who's only a minus 50, is only five years old, really doesn't need corrective lenses. And, and so adding some type of corrective lens, like even a, a soft multifocal, just puts a risk level on them that they don't need to have at all. When you can just start with the atropine alone, if they do progress in 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 a period of time after starting the atropine to the point where they need corrective lenses, now you can adjunct therapy. You can add that multifocal optic type of situation to the patient's situation. Now you're doing dual therapy, great. But again, I agree with you. I think in this case, um, this child obviously already needs corrective lenses. They're gonna have to wear something. It's either glasses or contact lenses. And why not uh, why not make their corrective lenses be the thing that corrects or slows their myopia progression rather than adding a medication when they already need spectacle lens or, or contact lens correction. Um, okay, and then we have one other case. This is an 11 year old female who's already wearing soft daily disposable lenses and glasses. Two myopic parents, a pretty big change in prescription over the last year from 375 to 475. Kaser, average, axial length a little bit on the longer side, gray iris color. Um, whoever wants to tackle this, how do you present this to the to the parents and the child, and what would you go with preferably for this patient? Um, I'll take this one. Um, this one's a kind of an easy one too because they're already wearing a contact, so it'd be either just okay. Well, we're we're gonna switch you to these, you know, new special contacts that you'll still wear the same exact way you're already doing. You'll do everything exactly the same, um, but it's also gonna slow down the change. So. That would be great. Um, you could do a soft multifocal and it would just be very easy for this patient to adapt. Um, or you can bring up ortho-K. 
um, that's also a great option for the patient as well. So with that, I kind of just ask more about, you know, if they want to be completely glasses free um, all hours of the day, 24 seven, basically. Um, but I would lean more towards the contact lens option because they're already wearing contact lenses. So we might as well just switch them to um, something like a, a MySight lens where they can, they can see. What do you think, Jackie? I would agree. I think I would just be prepared to have the conversation with these parents for them to return. This is like the classic case for me of like, well, why didn't my previous doctor put me on that contact mm -hmm. lens? And, you, and so I would be proactive and be like, there's a brand new lens on the market. Like yeah. I, just to, to head off the conversation of them getting mad at why are they not in that lens? And then now there's progression that they can't go backwards on. Because the other thing you'll get is like, oh, well, because there a lot of parents will blame themselves. They're, they're blaming the previous provider, but really they're blaming themselves for putting their kid on a lens that now gave them permanent progression in their vision loss um, and in their axial length. And so I would just be very careful with what I said for this case, because this kid should have been in, in myopic control a while ago. They've got flat Ks, long axial length. This, this case should have been treated years prior, in my opinion. Um, and th those are hard when you get them later. Yeah. And so at, at what state, so let me ask you this, do you ever, um, present dual therapy as an initial treatment, or is it always start with something and add a secondary line? Like, do you start with atropine and add the corrective lenses later, or do you start with corrective lenses and then add the atropine later, or do you ever do it all at once in a situation where it seems like things could really go fast? Is this a situation where you look at it and go, given everything here, I want to really hit the brakes on this one hard, let's do soft multifocals and put her on an atropine drop as well. I personally don't. Um, I just think it's a lot of new things to, to introduce at once to a child, um, just personally. Um, I don't, but I also am seeing my, you know, myopia patients like three, six, nine months. So I'm, I'm watching them closely. Um, what do, you, do you ever do that, Jason? Um, I would say that there there are some situations where, uh, again, if I feel like the child is really at risk for a significant future prescription, um, you can theoretically, if you have that discussion and the parents are really concerned, I could see starting them on atropine at the same time as ordering them an initial set of ortho-K lenses, for example, come back in a week, Reestablish baseline on the atropine, dispense the ortho-K lenses, and just, you know, and it really comes down to, again, is that unique situation where you have that child who you think is really looking like they are at risk for becoming that minus six or eight or 10, you know? I always, pres I, I never treat anything in any, like, I really rarely treat anything in my practice with a dual therapy right away. I always like to see what is the impact of one thing at a time but I plant the seed of your kid might need two things. Let's start with this one. And then I have a very short follow-up to see how stable they are. And, and then I'm very quick to employ the second. So I think planting this, I plant the seed for possible dual therapy, but I don't necessarily jump the gun on dual therapy because I want to see what each therapy does on its own. Um, yeah. But I will follow them just like like Dr. Jamie. I'm going to follow that that kid very closely. Yeah, I and I agree. I think generally yeah. speaking, you'd like to start one therapy, and even if you want to add the second one, let's give it a month or two or something on that therapy to to re to make sure the child's doing well with it, to establish new baselines, et cetera, and then you can go into the other therapy. And that's a good tip to plant a seed too, because if one modality doesn't work, you don't want to lose the trust of the parent. That okay, I trusted you, and we picked this option, and it didn't work. So why should I trust you to now add another thing? You know, I think if you're upfront and say, you know, this is the treatment, and then if it if it doesn't work as expected, this is this is my plan. Like I have the plan all along. Uh, so you're not acting like you're, you know, backpedaling with your with your patients and the parents. I think it's important as we have these discussions with the parents that we set goals and that we communicate those goals to the parent um, in a way that's not overthinking it or presenting them with too much information, um, yet at the same time knowing that we've got a goal in mind so that as that child comes back for follow-up, if we are not within our target area, that's a good time to bring up that second line of therapy 
as an adjunct to our initial treatment options. So as opposed to the child who maybe we're talking about dual therapy from the get-go, maybe we have that child who's progressed a little bit. And I do think it's important to say that, hey, look, these treatments are not going to stop everything necessarily entirely. So, so is that child who you initiate ortho K on, who's a minus 475, who progressed from a 375 a year ago, you put them in a soft multifocal. Now it's a year later, they're a minus five. Is that acceptable or is that not adequate? And the parent needs to know this is an acceptable level um, of progression that we never expected to stop it entirely um, so that the parent isn't necessarily looking for why is this child still progressing. And to that extent, we do have some really cool tools. And so for those of you who, who look at the idea of myopia control, myopia management um, in your practice and really want to embrace this and, and make the most of it, there are some amazing tools that are out there to communicate with parents. This is where your child is now. This is what the future holds theoretically. And this is how intervening can alter that course. And I think giving them these type of printouts is really awesome. Um, and it, again, it shows you where that child is on the typical age chart um, as far as risk for axial length, et cetera. And you can see certain cases where that child's just way outside of normal range risk. Um, I think this, again, is a nice way to communicate um, a higher level of concern because this child's already outside of you know, a standard deviation and so the concern level is high. So we do have these tools. Um, we have great instrumentation for measuring things like axial length, biometry now. And when you have an instrument like, like a myopia master where you can do biometry, which again is the critical part of managing myopia, quote unquote, or axial length growth. And that same instrument has this really great software built in to not just measure axial length, but to thoroughly help communicate the growth in the axial length and the risk and to monitor it over time and to track it. Um, again, we if you have children, you always take them in for their well visits and you always want to see where they fall in their growth profiles, et cetera. And this is that type of same information we can give to our patient where they are. And again, as you embark upon myopia management and you see that the normal trend follows a certain line, and maybe that child, their line is flatter than the projected line. And you can say, look, this is where we were headed and this is where we're going. You can see the impact of the myopia management we're doing. And again, that's a powerful visual that just helps reinforce what you're doing. So um, just to kind of wrap up here, um, communicating again, we've already talked about this. You guys have already mentioned this follow-up concept you know, it's different necessarily if I start someone on a therapy or if I'm just tracking them without therapy. Um, but what influences how soon you're going to see patients back, depending upon which therapy you're going to do? Um, I feel like with the contact lens options, I'm going to see them back sooner, not really checking their myopia, but checking to see how they're doing with the device, seeing how they're doing with the lenses. Um, but I still do like to do a follow up after atropine, too, after a few weeks, you know, just do a check-in. It's more of like a parent check-in, like how are they tolerating the drops? Are you able to get them in? Did you have any issues getting them from the pharmacy? Because I've done a one-month checkup before and they're like, oh, were we supposed to get those in the mail from the pharmacy? I haven't gotten them. And you're like, what? You were supposed to get them a month ago. So sometimes it's just, I always like to do at least, you know, with atropine, at least like a month follow-up or a couple weeks just to make sure they got the drops or using them. Um, with contact lenses, I'm not expecting there to be a progression within three to four weeks. I'm just making sure that they're they're happy at home and their eyes are healthy. So that's more of that that first fit. And then after that, I like to do the first year, like three, six, nine months, um, and then kind of reevaluate at the annual to see if they've changed and how much. So for me, I when I do atropine management, um, I have them come back in three to four weeks of using the drop. So I, I measure at before I dispense the drop, their accommodative system, their convergence system, cover test, and their pupils. And then when they have been on atropine, I have them come back and I recheck that. I also like to recheck how their light sensitivity is. Usually they're light sensitive the first one to two weeks. It should be getting better by week three or four. Um, and so that's something else to think about. 
And then the other thing to think about for the atropine kids, a lot of pediatric ophthalmologists are really in, uh, really strict about wearing sunglasses. So having education on sunglasses if you're prescribing atropine because you are inhibiting, even though it's microscopic and we're not totally sure, because I will say having measured pupils, oftentimes my measurements look the same, um, but theoretically you're making it harder for the pupil to constrict in response to sunlight. So it's letting in more light than normal. So you are putting them at a higher risk. So also just, it helps me follow up on making sure the parent understands the importance of sunglasses if they're using atropine. Um, and then, usually you're also just showing them tips on getting them in it's, it's you're it's teaching parents how to put eye drops in oftentimes it takes one or two visits so i actually think i follow up with atropine pretty quickly and then spread it out later um to do it that way yeah i mean i agree i think it's important to recognize that even though low dose atropine is very mild um you still can see some children drop a little bit of myopia after they start atropine. You might have baselined them at minus a half, they come back after a couple of weeks on atropine and now you're getting them at minus a quarter. And so, you know, again, remeasuring things like their refractive status, their axial length, once they've started atropine or orthocate as well, um, where you're reshaping the cornea and you're not gonna get a chance to remeasure things in their pre-orthocase state again till they stop orthocase someday. I think it's critical to to again reestablish baselines with those therapies in particular. Soft multifocal is not quite as important, but um, I do think that following them back again just demonstrates the level of concern that this is real, that this is about the child's ocular health, and that we take this seriously. And I think that's important um, in terms of giving them recommendations for a. a a de designated in uh, designated follow-up time for whatever that patient's doing. I would also just add one final thing on the softs is I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of cover tests at near. Um, when you mm. are messing with near ads, um, particularly for the soft lenses, I've had a lot of kids complain of blur with the soft multifocals um, what, back in the day prior to my site or if someone's using an off-label lens instead of my site and you can over plus a kid. Um, and so that can impact their ocular and they'll complain of double and you decrease the, the ad or you decrease the strength of, of the lens and that'll improve their ocular alignment. So do know that, especially particularly the softs, I've had some issues with kids who also have an accommodated esophoria and it, it can go, you can't overcorrect it and then they're uncomfortable. So um, just making sure you do cover test at baseline and at follow up as well. That's a great point. Well, um, with that, um, I think we can bring Bill back on if he wants to come back and join us for a wrap up here, if there's any questions or any Absolutely, we have a lot of questions, but I, I know we don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions for the group. Um, first, a simple one that I'm gonna throw out to you because I know we talked about it. We didn't really go into depth, but uh, one of the docs has a question that says, that why do we care about iris color and why is it important in myopia treatment? Well, I think it, it comes into play with atropine. Um, your your brown-eyed children are going to be able to tolerate a higher concentration than your blue eyes, theoretically. So mm -hmm. if I've got a child with darker irises, I, especially in that first case that we talked about, the five-year-old who's already on the minus side with two myopic parents and a long axial length already, I'm very tempted to go 0.05 on that child already with brown irises. If that child had blue irises, I probably would default to 0.025. So I think that just comes down into what, what they'll tolerate for the concentration of atropine. That's the reason I put those in there. Excellent. Um, I've got a question here that hits home for me because in my community, I have a lot of docs that, that prescribe atropine and they don't see them back for a year. Um, and I have patients coming to my practice that have taken atropine for maybe a year or two, and then they abruptly stop it. So can you mention a little bit about rebound? And um, do you talk to your patients about the abrupt cessation of atropine and any issues that go along with it? I'll let Jackie take that one. So the way that I was trained on atropine is you essentially are going to put them on for two years and just be very candid. You're going to be on this for two years. And then usually I then see them at the end of two years and have a discussion with them about if they're stable and they want to try weaning off of it. I'm always a big fan of tapering. So why don't we go down to every other day and see what happens and then measure them again. And then if they're, then we go down to a few times a week and taper them. And then if I see it, my, my creeping back in, then you just put them back on it. And, and so I don't, 
like the cons there is studies that show that if you take them off abruptly they're going to get some rebound um and so i i would rather but not everyone and so that's the hard part is you're working with an individual not necessarily with a clinical trial so i always just give the parent you know technically you might be fine if we just went cold turkey i like to wean people off and see what happens and i would say it's 50 50. i would say 50 percent of the time i wean people off and they're fine um and then sometimes you wean them off you're like nope it's coming back and then you just put them back on so i think if you do stop your treatment you need to keep monitoring it doesn't mean you stop monitoring or treating the fact that they have elongated axial length you're just seeing if the two years was long enough yeah and i think that i think it's critical if you actually go back and look at the atom studies atom one two and three the the rebound effect that occurred from stopping atropine somewhat correlated to the regression of axial length that occurred when they started atropine and so if you look at the data and you had a child whose axial length was 24, for example, and then they were put on atropine, their axial length shortened to 23.9. Well, that didn't really happen, right? Or did it? And so then when, so then if you don't account for that change in axial length that happens from the initiation of therapy, then when you stop it, you're gonna, that's gonna jump back immediately upon cessation. And so that's why we talk about reestablishing baselines. Your baseline for atropine is, is going to carry through, and that's going to be your baseline while they're on atropine therapy. But the minute you stop atropine, you have to revert back to the baseline you started before therapy, not where they were at when they were on the atropine. So that's critical. And I'm not, I'm not sure that rebounding happens in reality as much as we think it does. I think that's more of an attribute of the negative rebound you get when you start it. Excellent. I think I'm it also happens I'm, I'm sorry. for the kid too. I was just going to say, I, I agree 100% uh, with what Jason was saying. And I think also it's the two year mark can be arbitrary and parents want to be off of it in two years. But if that kid happens to be in the middle of IV classes in high school and they're studying, like so it's, there's so many other reasons why it's like, oh, my nearsighted got worse or I was good and then I went to law school. And you're like, okay, well. So I think, again, everything's individualized. Um, but I, Jason, to Jason's point, for me, and I didn't even think about it. Because for me, the baseline is always the baseline before we initiate treatment. I wouldn't even think about the baseline being the on-treatment baseline. So that's interesting. Hmm. So two more questions. One is an ortho K question. And um, how did how the panel, how do you guys handle a child that becomes an adult and now is driving and they're in ortho K and now they, they, all of a sudden they never had glare before and the day after they get their driver's license, now they have glare at night. And then also, how do you deal with the adult who comes back from college and they're maybe they're 22 years old now? And would you continue with okay or not? So how do you handle those two situations? Well, I have a lot of adults who do ortho okay and they're just, just fine and happy as can be with it. I think that as a child grows, um, there we know that their risk of their myopia progressing rapidly decreases with age. So, you know. If we have a child who we've put in ortho K when they were six years old and we put them in a limited optic zone to try to control their myopia, as they become older, we can start to open that optic zone up a little bit and give them a bigger treatment area and reduce some of that effect. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't pull them out of lenses just because of that. Now, if I do have a, a, a child who becomes that age and they do complain about that issue, then we can always revisit the idea of multifocal soft lenses instead. Um, but you may have uh, visual symptoms with those as well. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I have a lot of people, a lot of kids that went to college and they'll say, I don't want to wear ortho K and say, that's fine. And we have them going to soft lenses and then they come back during uh, winter break and they say, I hate wearing soft lenses. I want to go back into my ortho K. So I think we just, I just have that discussion. I have that discussion before they go to college because things are different when you're in a dorm um, with contact lens habits and hygiene. So I just have that discussion up front and kind of give them the option. But it's it's interesting how many people think they won't want to wear ortho as an adult and then they realize they do. And I have a lot of friends and patients that do ortho as an adult just because they like it. So I don't think it's only limited to children. Um, and as far as glare goes, I think too, like you have to think about how they've been wearing these lenses for years and their brain is almost like adapted to it. Um, so I don't think it's as big of an issue. And the nice part about a lot of ortho K, especially if you're doing like wave lenses, you can really customize uh, the treatment zone. 
So like you said, as they get older, you can customize it. It's not a one size fits all for every child. Um, you can open that up a little bit. Awesome. Well, great answers. My last question is a practice management question. And it's about, um, we talked about talking to all myopes about myopia control to their parents and to the patients themselves, to the kids themselves. Um, it, it does add time to your examination. Um, and sometimes, depending on the parents, it could add a lot of time to it. So some practitioners have gone to separate evaluations, myopia control evaluations. They do their routine exam, they identify the issues, and they have the, the child and the parents come back for a separate outside of routine exam. Uh, how do you guys handle things like that? Do you just talk about with every single exam you see and then start therapy, or do you have them back for an evaluation, um, measure biometry, and then ha and, and have a separate myopic management evaluation? I guess what I'm saying. That's kind of, that's a complex question, and I think it depends on where you practice, um, how many providers you have. Um, so I've done both. So I, right now in my cold start, so I have time, um, and I love talking to people. So if I have someone referred in, um, I'll sit with them and, and talk to them for like a half hour or so. I do charge for my time. I do charge for a consultation um, fee, and I never have parents complain about that. Like if they decide to sign on, um, for their treatment, I don't charge it. I just waive it or I apply it to their treatment. But I think you should always charge for your time. Um, I think that's that's important. Um, but you know, when I was in my busier office, I would talk about it during the exam. If it seemed like um, something that was going to take a while, I would just say, "Why don't we come back? We're going to schedule a separate appointment." Um, if it seemed like it, you can kind of gauge it, go by feel. Um, in a lot of practices, you might be in a group setting. And maybe you don't feel totally confident about myopia management and you want your colleague to see them. I think that's a great way to hand off and say, I'm going to have you see my colleague um, back in a couple of weeks and they're going to talk to you about all these options. So if you don't love myopia management, that's okay. Um, send them to a colleague that does. Um, so I think it just depends on what setting that you're in um, and how much time you have uh, per patient. But don't try to rush it. If you feel like you're going to have to rush it, then just schedule that second appointment. I think it's, it's really worth your time and energy instead of trying to do a 60 second, you know, decide now, yes or no, if not, I'll see you in a year. Um, so if you really have short exam times, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't, I think you should be setting up that secondary appointment. So Jackie, Jason, anything you wanna to add to that? I love Jackie's idea of doing a telemedicine appointment, just schedule yeah. them for a consult, you know, as a, a call online and, and have, you know, an opportunity to talk to them about it then. Um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I, I, I agree with Jamie. I think it depends. Some patients come in and, and they've already, they're knowledgeable and they're ready to go and you can streamline into the process. Others need time to think about it. So whether it's scheduling to come back in person or doing it online, um, it's really more appropriate sometimes just to schedule a follow-up appointment. So does that mean you're doing, you're doing biometry routinely on these children, regardless of whether they're proceeding with? So have you incorporated biometry into routine measurement? Is it part of your care? So you have that number, regardless or not of whether they're moving forward with treatment? Um, we do at the school now. We have had biometry as part of every child's routine appointment um, for the last couple of years. Excellent. Jackie, so, I don't have biometry. Yeah, I don't have biometry in my practice, which I think is common for other people that aren't specialists. And I don't have, you know, I don't have anything to measure Ks or anything like that. So for me, because again, I, I'm a big fan of lateral referrals and optometry. You know, we all can't be the best at everything. So my big thing is I think every optometrist should be talking about this with your patients, but it doesn't mean you have to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it, then you should have a network of people to refer them to. And if you have good relationships with them, you're not losing the pa patient or the family by any means. So for me, I actually have a referral form with a local optometrist that does a ton of myopia control for ortho -K. That's their favorite methodology. And so we literally just have a form that my office will fax over and their office will just call the patient to schedule biometry if that's all I want. And they're very, we're very, we hashed out a good professional relationship of, hey, I'm seeing this kiddo. They're not ready for myopia management. They're a low hyper, but I want to know what their axial length is. And so the, I just tell the parent, I'm going to have you go to this office. They're going to measure the biometry and their doctor, they only charge for the like procedure 
itself and I charge for the professional interpretation of that result. Mm -hmm. So they send it directly to me and then I consult the parent with them um, with all the measurements on their telemed visit based off of what I have. Um, and so I think that's a wonderful way, wonderful way to incorporate lateral referrals in optometry um, without losing the patient. You can still manage it, have the conversation with them. And then if they end up wanting ortho, okay, well, they already met that office, so they already know the staff. So then it's really easy for me to send back and be like, hey, the kid actually wants ortho, okay, so call them back and have them come back in. Um, so I find that works really well. Um, and the, I've had no problem, the providers have no problem with that because they understand that Usually I'm also seeing the other seven kids in the family or something like that. So um, I think we need to do better about that because I feel like as as we get more subspecialized in our fields, um, we can't all do, do it all. And, and it's I think it's to the parent and the patient's benefit if we start having people like Jamie. Like if I had oh, if I had Jamie in, in an office nearby, it would be amazing um, <laughs> to be able to send her okay that I that I had. So. Yeah, I awesome. think yeah, just talking about referrals though, it's just don't don't steal patients, guys. Just don't do it. Like don't sell the glasses. Like I literally will tell them, you are gonna go back to doctor whoever and get your glasses with them. Um and I am very clear about that. And it's it's been hard as a cold start. Um my number one referrals are ophthalmologists because every optometrist I have gone to, their first question is, is do you have an optical? And then as soon as I say that I do, even though it's small they're like immediately like, no, I'm not referring to you, which is, it's kind of a bummer, even though I'll say like, I'm very clear about it. Like I, I won't sell glasses to your patients. Um, you know, I'm not going to steal them. I think we're like afraid to lose a glasses sale, which is so silly. And I wish we weren't like that. Um, so it's hard, but just when you are referring, if people get referred to you, just really try to make that clear cut. Like I am managing this, this doctor is still doing your routine care. Um, and just co-manage with your with your neighboring doctors, and I think that builds a nice relationship that way. Oh, well, a ton of great information tonight, guys! I can't thank you all enough for sharing your expertise with us, and I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. And I want to wish everyone a great night. Thank you again. Thank you.